going to go live. Okay, good evening, everybody. We are just getting ourselves ready to start. So, um, of course, the phone immediately goes off, probably to tell us that we're starting a little bit early. Um, but we will be kicking off in a few minutes. So just stand by and uh, we'll get the show on the road for you. Okay. Well, I think we're as close to 8.45 as we're going to get, Dave. We're sneaking up on it. Okay. So, uh, good evening, and uh, thanks very much for joining us on this uh, Friday night. This is the first time in a long while, actually, that Dave and I have uh, done a live stream together. Um, I think January? No, end of May. We did the, oh. the eclipse. Oh, right. Yes, I yes. forgot the eclipse. That wasn't, that wasn't an SDAA event, but we supported the uh, timeanddate.com with the lunar eclipse. Okay. And uh, most of the night we were under clouds, and the last 15 minutes or so, it peeked out from underneath those clouds, and we saw the moon in uh, full eclipse setting on the western horizon. We did indeed. I remember that. But I think the uh, last sort of... DSO live stream we did was January. Right? Probably. Okay. Yep. Well, um, we're coming from a new location this evening. Uh, we're coming from Blossom Valley in California. And for those of you that don't know Blossom Valley, it is east of El Cajon and west of um, Alpine. Uh, we're pretty close to Lake Jennings. And um, as you probably guessed, it's myself and Dave Decker from the San Diego Astronomy Association. And we're looking forward to uh, showing you a few of the uh, wonders of the night sky uh, this evening, um, particularly in the eastern skies, since uh, from this location, east uh, is by far the best and easiest direction for us. And if I hesitate a little bit, it's probably because I've got the monitor function too high in my headset. So I'm actually talking against myself, which confuses my brain no end. Anyway, um, let's begin with a few introductory slides. So uh, tonight's event, as I said, is coming from Blossom Valley. Um, this is a view of the location uh, taken during the early evening. Uh, we have incredible views here from uh, what is my new uh, home. Uh, we moved in here about uh, two weeks ago and uh, this is the first of hopefully uh, many live streams. And Dave has been kind enough to come over and join me this evening. So um, welcome, Dave. And uh, Thank you very much. You have a lovely place here. Um, lots of property, lots of dark sky. And uh, I live in La Mesa under very bright sky, so I'm quite jealous, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't trying to make you jealous, uh, <laughs> but it is a, a nice location and uh, it did take us a long, a long while to find. So um, kind of pleased that we managed to get that sorted out. And uh, I'm actually just in the process of uh, closing escrow on my property in Scripps Ranch uh, in North County, San Diego. And uh, we've obviously done a number of live streams from there. Um, so this is the location, um, the red arterial road that you see there is I-8 and we're in Bortle 7 skies here so it's a little bit of an improvement from North County um, and actually you only have to drive another 10 or 15 miles and you can get down into Bortle 4 or 5 skies. Uh, one of the places uh, that's probably only about 10 minutes away from here is uh, Sunrise Highway and uh, we use that uh, for our live stream uh, back in uh, May when we did the lunar eclipse together. 
and I'm using my standard equipment tonight, uh, which is based around a Celestron's uh, eight-inch Smith Cassegrain, um, paired with a 0.6 times focal reducer, a, a ZWO ASI 533 color one-shot camera, um, and uh, all mounted on an EQ6R Pro mount. Uh, this has been my rig of choice now for about a year, uh, possibly a bit longer, um, and I use it both for EAA and uh, photometry, um, and it's proven to be a very good rig. It gives me a field of view of about half a degree, and just so that when you're looking at the images in a few moments, you can put that in some context, uh, basically the moon would almost completely fill the field of view. So anything that we're kind of looking at when I'm fully zoomed out, uh, if you can imagine the moon filling that field of view, that will give you an approximate um, idea of what the object would look like if you could see it with the naked eye. And um, we're going to be using a, 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 a tool called SharpCap Pro, uh, which is a, a kind of the industry de facto standard for EAA, which is an electronically assisted astronomy. Um, uh, it allows us to take images relatively fast, and I'm going to be taking 15 seconds subs tonight. And then basically those subs are averaged together, and that produces a image of that basically is got an improving signal to noise ratio. And we can actually pull some incredible detail out um, of the sky in a very short period of time. And we will actually be bringing up the first of those views in a couple of minutes. And this is a complete list of the hardware and software that I've got running. Um, the only thing I'm not using this evening because I'm just using 15 second subs, I'm not using any guiding. So I'm not using the PhD2 tool, basically just a, um, allow or using the tracking capability of the um, EQ6R. Okay, so before we begin, Dave, um, any words of wisdom or should we dry, dive straight in? Well, just a few. Um, things have really relaxed quite a bit uh, since uh, mid June when the state changed their policies on COVID. And uh, some of our venues have begun to open up, so we are actually reinstituting. Uh, a few of our regular monthly in-person live at the telescope uh, outreach events. And currently we are supporting the events at Oak Oasis uh, and uh, Sycamore Canyon off Highway 67, uh, KQ Ranch, and um, our own site, Tierra del Sol in the East uh, County area. We do have a public night, one public night each month. So uh, there's a few events we're getting started, um, and uh, we're very happy to be able to do that. We will include uh, these uh, EAA kinds of virtual events along with our in-person events, and we will put together some kind of a hybrid program that um, will probably evolve as we start to institute all these new policies. So check our calendar, the public calendar, on the SDAA website for uh, announcements regarding public star party, public outreach events. And um, come on out and see us in person. And maybe you will even find uh, Gary and I sitting out there with a, a big monitor and a telescope with a camera on it. And uh, talking of big monitors, uh, we are actually um, sitting in front of a 40-inch uh, monitor, which is going to be my new outreach monitor. Um, uh, any of you visual guys out there, I will make sure that it's pointed in the opposite direction so that you can actually still see the sky, because um, this thing's pretty bright. Um, but we are sitting in front of a very large monitor this evening, um, which is affording us some fairly interesting views. And uh, for our first target this evening, uh, we're actually going to view uh, the Lagoon Nebula M8. And uh, we've actually been imaging this for a few minutes. 
and okay so I've got to get there we go and uh, hopefully that should be up on the screen now um, okay um, and while I do have the chat um, running so if anybody's got any questions we will be happy to answer them um, welcome to this 22nd day hello from Allied Gardens area of San Diego um, so if you've got any questions uh, please post those in the chat window and we will try and answer them there may be a little bit of a delay between when we see the question and when you post it just because of the way I've got my software set up so if you ask a question and we don't get to it for, for a couple of minutes um, please bear with us as I swap backwards and forwards so um, Dave tell us a little bit about the Lagoon Nebula well the, the Lagoon Nebula uh, identified most commonly as M8 M being the Messier catalog uh, was probably discovered a uh, hundred years or so before that by other astronomers uh, Messier did catalog it and um, the supposition is that he was probably uh, initially looking at the open cluster uh, more than the nebulosity. So the open cluster, which is actually on our view here, is at the bottom edge of the, uh, of the nebula, kind of a uh, cluster of stars there. And in a small scope, a scope with small aperture, um, you'll see the, 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 the open cluster quite uh, clearly, and you'll have to look very hard to see the nebulosity. In a large scope, uh, you can see the nebulosity fairly well uh, with an eyepiece. And of course, with a camera, we can, we can uh, photograph the nebulosity and uh, make it look quite bright. But it is log logged as um, Messier uh, item number eight. And uh, he probably did see the, uh, the open cluster first. Uh, this is a, uh, a standard, pretty standard uh, star forming region, uh, nebulosity. Um, it's about, um, say, 4,000 to 4,500 light years uh, from here. And um, it does show uh, new stars. If you were to analyze this from a scientific perspective, we could probably get down and, and tell, tell you a lot of things about the stars themselves. Uh, that's not our purpose here tonight. It's here tonight. We're showing you some of these rather uh, open, nice summer and fall objects that uh, that we can see in a uh, in a uh, backyard telescope. Yes, and um, we can see both the nebulosity. There are also some uh, fairly distinct dust lanes. Um, if you're looking at the image now on the screen to the lower part of the image I'm not sure if my cursor is showing up but if it is showing up I'm just running my uh, cursor around one of the, one of the dust lanes um, and uh, as you can see it's a um, beautiful image it's actually quite low on the horizon um, about 25 degrees on the horizon so fairly low and this is in the constellation of Sagittarius okay um, which by the way uh, Sagittarius uh, hosts the center of our galaxy the Milky Way galaxy and these first um, four or five objects we looked at look at tonight will be in that general area towards the center of our galaxy uh, so anyway, this is the first one. Uh, M20, I think, might be uh, our second one, Gary. Oh yeah, an M M20 is indeed uh, pretty close. So um, you're not going to be able to see this, um, but I'm I've gone onto my Sky Map, which is a program called Cart to Seal. I've selected M20. I'm now going to move the telescope uh, to M20. I'm going to turn the live stacking off here for a second and we are probably every time I move the telescope we are going to do what's called a plate solve uh, which just ensures that we're pointing in the correct direction um, 
it's a way of comparing where the scope's pointing to where it should be and then it makes some minor corrections to the position of the scope. So it's just doing the plate solve now and actually we were right on target. Um, I'm going to start live stacking. 5 .01. And I need to clear the previous image. So, so M20 is, is actually part of the same star forming region nebulosity complex that uh, M8 belongs to. It's uh, very close to it in the sky. And um, uh, it's a similar kind of an object that has star forming regions. Um, shows lots of uh, different kinds of nebulosity, but it has an interesting feature that is uh, kind of cool, and that is that the there's sort of a blue hazy nebulosity uh, on one side of, of uh, the triffid, and um, so uh, that that is a different kind of a nebula, and uh, we have reflection nebulas, and we have uh, nebulas that are creating their own light and the uh, the blue one uh, and let me get my facts straight here so I'm trying to quickly check um, zoomed in. you know there's way too much information on these automated systems you know Gary <coughs> you have to read whole paragraphs to get all the details um, but a reflection nebula is a nebula that reflects light from a star. So a star creates the light, and the nebulosity is sort of a cloud that is lit up, sort of like a light bulb lighting up uh, a cloud inside. But a nebula that is uh, radiating its own light is uh, caused by um, ionized gases that are creating, actually creating the light and gives you a different color. So the important thing here with the triffid is we can see uh, evidence of both kinds of nebulas and the, the blue section on the lower left of our image here hopefully it's up I think it is and um, the red section is uh, the more traditional uh, star forming region that we see and we're just going to give this a few moments to collect a uh, some images so we're stacking we've stacked Eight images currently so that's about 120 seconds worth of data uh, so two minutes not very much um, let me just make some so I found the good facts here Gary oh you did yes I need to make sure that we get our our audience uh, straight on this okay um, the the blue nebula that you see on the side is a reflection nebula that's reflecting light from stars and the uh, the reddish colored portion of the nebula is an emission nebula. So the emission nebula is where the ionized gases are creating their own light. Right. And the blue nebula on the side is reflecting light from uh, one or more of the stars in that uh, in that region. So here we have an example of an emission nebula, which is the red one, and a reflection nebula, which is the blue one, uh, all in the same sort of structure. And we are actually being photobombed currently, uh, probably by one or more satellites. You may be able to see these faint <laughs> lines going across the image. Um, those are uh, satellite trails. So we're seeing the reflected light from um, several satellites. And since, since they were... Uh, they came up pretty much together, I'm guessing that's probably... Starlink or something, right? <laughs> could be. That could easily be. There um, are many, many satellites. Uh, anytime you have a fairly dark site and you take a telescope out and look at something with a fairly wide field of view, uh, you will see satellites going through your field of view all night long. Yes. And it's a pretty common situation now. Um, in photographing uh, these objects, there are ways that we can remove some of that Re reject those frames, but uh, it's another layer of complexity. So, anyway, you just saw apparently uh, probably some of those nice satellites. Yes, um, definitely one or two went through through the image there. Um, but we have a uh, nice image of the Triffidambula forming here, um, and uh, it's a fairly um, fairly 
easy object to spot even with a relatively small telescope visually it is quite bright about a seventh magnitude um, and again uh, not particularly high on the horizon just 33 degrees above the northern horizon okay uh, once again in the constellation of Sagittarius so Dave let's, uh, should we try on our target yes let's try uh, M17 M17 uh, I like to call it the swan okay and um, <clears throat> It is a little bit higher in the sky, uh, also in the same general area towards the center of the Milky Way, only a little bit farther, uh, a little bit farther up on the horizon. And, and uh, I'm actually going to save the Trifid Nebula there, just so that we've got a record. I'm going to go to M17. I've commanded the scope to move. I'm probably on target, but I'm going to do a plate solve anyway, just to uh, make sure. And uh, then we will look at our next target, another nebula, I believe. Um, yes, it is. Um, the Omega Nebula, or the Swan Nebula, or the Checkmark Nebula uh, in the Macier catalog. It's Macier 17. And. Um, some people say it looks like a fish in the ocean with an open mouth. There's all kinds of different ways you can take a look at this when we get it up on the screen for you. But uh, it is yet another um, star forming region uh, and towards the center of the Milky Way. All of these nebulas we've been looking at are about 4,000 to 6,000 light years from us. So they're pretty much in the same general area towards the center of the, uh, from, our, from our position towards the center of the um, uh, galaxy. Now, they're not actually in the center of the galaxy. That just happens to be the direction we're looking. The center of the galaxy is, is quite a bit further than uh, 7,000 light years from us. It's more like about, um, say, oh, 30,000 light years from us. So we're looking towards the center of the galaxy when we see these nebulas. Okay. Um, and I am confusing myself by switching backwards and forwards between too many screens on the other laptop. Um, for those of you who are interested, uh, this is the way that I can control the, uh, the way the image displays on the screen. I can shift my black level. I can shift my white level, which I typically keep all the way up here. And then most importantly, I can change my mid level. And that allows me to uh, either make the um, middle part place more or less emphasis on the on the middle part of the, the the um, intensity levels. I can also color balance as well, which I can do with the buttons in the lower right hand corner. Um, and typically we try and get the uh, red, blue and green channels approximately color balanced, but I can manually change those as well if I want to. Uh, again, just to improve the visual of the image. So here we have the Trifid ne Nebula. Um, let me just look at that full screen. Uh, kind of a bit noisy in the bottom here, so I'm probably I'm going to bring up the uh, I'm going to bring up the controls again. Let's bring that back and let's see what that looks like. A little better. So the uh, Lagoon Nebula, M8. Oh, sorry. The, it's the, the Triffid Nebula, M20. And this nebula, which is the Swan or Omega uh, M17, are all in the same large area, uh, cloud forming region, about the same distance from us and in the same general direction. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll be looking at M16, which is another nebula in the same general area as well. Uh, this here, the nebula we have now, the Swan Nebula, 
uh, M17 is um, they estimate that the total mass of a cloud in this in this nebula is probably more than 800 masses of our sun. And uh, if that's true, it probably has a little bit more mass in it than the uh, Orion Nebula, which is uh, uh, very very easy for us to see um, in the uh, in the winter time. Uh, the reason the Orion Nebula looks so bright is that it's much closer than uh, the uh, these nebulas here. Orion is probably in the order of uh, 1,500 uh, light years instead of you know 6,000 light years. So that's a little bit different. And Dave mentioned that we're seeing a lot of stars in the image and you can obviously see from the image displayed at the moment there is indeed a lot of stars and the reason for this is because we're actually looking through the long we're actually looking at the Milky Way so if you imagine that the Milky Way which is uh, basically a dinner plate shape um, we are at a point in that dinner plate looking through the entire width of the dinner plate. So we're looking along the long axes. And that's the reason we're seeing so many stars, um, because we are looking through the long axes of the Milky Way. Um, and we see these this massive um, grouping of stars um, at various distances away from us. If we were to point the uh, telescope probably only about an hour 10 or 15 degrees so that we actually were looking through the short axis of the Milky Way or a much shorter part you would see that the number of stars uh, on a, in a typical view would would drop away significantly so um, whenever you're looking at a target that's in the Milky Way you will you will always see this um, uh, massive grouping of stars um, and these can be close or far away um, within our within our galaxy. Okay, so we have a pretty decent image of M17. So I am going to save that before we move on. And Dave, where am I going next? Uh, M16. Okay, M16. So Dave actually uh, spent some time uh, before he came over today and um, put together a target list, um, which makes my life pretty easy um, because I'm basically driving the software here and adding some facts. Um, we usually do a theme, but tonight um, really our theme is just looking at the eastern skies because that's the really good outlook that I've got here at this property and there are so many targets available to us in the eastern skies because we're basically looking at parts different parts of the Milky Way um, we, we just thought we'd run through a number of those targets for your enjoyment this evening right so I've moved to M16 I need to update my target there I need to plate solve so that I can clearly align my scope. I need to reset my stack so that we're not looking at the old picture. And we will then be looking at M16, which is? Uh, two common names for M16. One is the Eagle Nebula, which uh, the one that I usually use. And also apparently a common name is the Star Queen Nebula. Uh, which I have heard, but um, in common in conversation, uh, in my conversation, I usually use the Eagle Nebula, or it's Messier number number 16. And um, again, uh, the likelihood of Charles Messier seeing the nebulosity here is pretty slim. He probably saw um, the cluster of stars in the area, as opposed to the actual details of the nebulosity. But uh, tonight, hopefully, we will get a decent view of the nebulosity. And um, uh, again, this is about 5,700, um, or 5.7 thousand light years away, 5,700 light years away. So it's in the same range as the other three nebulas we've looked at already tonight, and probably in part of the same 
a large uh, star forming region that uh, the others are associated with as well. This is a little bit higher in the sky and um, it is uh, another pretty much a standard kind of a uh, nebulosity with uh, open clusters associated with it, lots of young stars uh, forming and, uh, and so forth. Um, the interesting thing and the very interesting thing about this nebula is a picture that was uh, taken. I believe the um, it's accredited to Hubble Space Telescope, one of their earlier pictures. It is, yeah. And um, it's a picture you have seen many, many times on various uh, astronomy shows on TV and so forth. Uh, the picture is called the Pillars of Creation. So the Pillars of Creation are these three sort of blob pillory looking things that are glowing at the tips uh, that invokes all kinds of interesting science fiction themes about um, things that are happening in space and uh, stars being formed and so forth. Uh, the pillars of creation are at the heart of the Eagle Nebula. And I can't tell you exactly where in the Eagle it is, um, but when the if you're looking at the screen, I think it's up now for you. Um, you will see it's sort of a check mark, a little check mark kind of a thing in the center of this nebulosity. And that is what has invoked or caused us to give it the name the Eagle. Because if you look at it in the right direction, it does look sort of like an Eagle in flight, or at least uh, with its wings, wings extended. And in that area, um, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, in its earlier part of its of its life um, has uh, imaged the pillars of creation and uh, so lots of interesting history concerning that and um, when you actually see the Hubble photograph you will um, you will, one of the sh things that you will notice is that the colors are completely different and you might kind of wonder why and that's because the Hubble images are all displayed in what's called the Hubble color palette, which is a way of mapping the true color to the Hubble palette, kind of much in the same way that we're taking, if you like, the true color that's coming into the camera. And I can manipulate it. Um, with the controls I've got. For instance, if I bring up my blue level quite dramatically, I can completely change how you see the, the image. Of course, the image isn't changing. It's just the way that the software is interpreting it. And so when you see the pillars of creation on the Hubble, you will see that they're usually shot against what looks to be a very bluey greeny background with some um, and the pillars themselves are very brown and yellow, whereas obviously what we were looking at a few moments ago was much redder in hue. And I'm going to go back and rebalance my color so that you see that um, there is another interesting area um, that's quite well known in this um, nebula. It's uh, another area of dark nebulosity and it's called the elephant's trunk. And I believe this is the elephant's trunk right here. So um, obviously when people are looking at these images either on photographs or visually, um, they kind of conjure up uh, various um, they usually get mapped to some sort of animal um, and this area here is called the elephant's trunk. Okay, right. And How about uh, M22? Okay, so I think we're going to move on to a yeah, different, different type yeah. of target yeah. now. We've seen um, a number of nebula and as Dave said, those are either a mission nebula uh, where an area of um, gas is being excited and it's emitting energy and you're seeing the energy in the form of light or, or a reflection nebula uh, where starlight is illuminating with its own light and that is reflecting off much like 
the light of the moon that you see is the light being reflected from the sun back to earth um, and also we see some of these dark areas which is um, not really so much a, a nebulosity because uh, it's not luminous but they're dust very thick dust lanes that are blocking um, certain features um, so now we're going to look at a completely different target which is m22 and this is fairly close um, in physical location in the sky. Uh, we're still going to be, I think, in the uh, constellation of Sagittarius. So I'm yep. going to slew the scope. I am going to update my parameters here. I always like to try and keep a record and of course I forgot to save the last one but whatever um, I try and I like to try and keep a record of the various images that we see um, and then those those are kept for the evenings that we end up doing a outreach event and of course the clouds come in so uh, we tend to use those types of images um, at that point in time but not tonight dear but not tonight we have beautiful skies um, here in Blossom Valley I am just going to make sure that we're on target by play solving. So while you're moving the scope, yes. um, something that we are not going to show you tonight, but you are welcome to go outside in your backyard and take a quick look with just your naked eye. And right now in the eastern sky, we have two fabulous planets shining brightly. The one close to the horizon is Jupiter. And the one higher on the right horizon to the right of it is Saturn. And if you recall, uh, last December, uh, I think was it was it early December, mid December? Oh, was that it was that the uh, winter? I'm not sure, Dave. The winter solstice. We did the the Great Conjunction. Oh right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Great Conjunction is a conjunction of those two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, where they were very very close to each other. Now they're probably maybe 10 or 15 degrees apart in the sky. But if you have a view of the eastern sky right now, you can stick your head out, look to the east, and you will see a very bright Jupiter sitting close to the horizon and a dimmer Saturn farther up and to the right. And uh, those two are the two large planets in our solar system. We're not going to show you those tonight because our imaging train is set up to look at things that are fairly large in the sky and planets are very, very small and need a lot more magnification to get to good detail. But you can see them with your naked eye. Um, I mean, we could swing the scope on at some point just to see what we get. We're not going to get a great image, I can tell you that. Um, but we can certainly sure. take a look if you want. Um, but now we're looking at something completely different. And unfortunately, I've managed to get my window here disassociated with uh, the other window, which is annoying. Um, let me, okay. But anyway, um, we have a globular cluster, uh, which is M22, another Messier object. Um, so, um, officially credited in its discovery to Charles Mazier, who we've done a presentation on in the past. Uh, this is a spectacular um, cluster, which just disappeared on me. Uh, I, oh, I turned the live stacking off. Okay. Um, all right. Let me, let me turn the lives. Okay. Oh, you did good. Yeah. Uh, so globular clusters, um, now this one, M22, uh, which is right on the upper left-hand side of the teapot of Sagittarius. So for those of you that know what I'm talking about, Sagittarius is a uh, constellation in the southern sky during the summer months. And uh, it looks sort of like a teapot with a handle on the left and with a spout on the right and with a sort of a tent-shaped lid on top. Uh, we like to say that if you were to take that handle and tip that teapot over towards the spout, that you would see a lot of steam coming out of that, that uh, spout. And that steam essentially is the southern end 
of our view of the Milky Way. And you can follow that cloud, that, uh, that bright cloud of stars all the way across the sky, starting from the spout of uh, the Sagittarius teapot. But also in Sagittarius, just to the left of the very top of the teapot, is this globular cluster. And um, it is very big, it is very bright. Um, it's a very easy object to see. I have seen it with naked eye on a dark night, very good dark sky. Uh, binoculars are great to view the uh, uh, M22 globular cluster. And uh, almost any telescope of any size will display it quite nicely under a dark sky. So uh, this globular cluster is, is big. It's about uh, 10,000 light years from us. Um, and um, globular clusters are very interesting. What are we doing? Here, I right? am trying desperately <laughs> as you're talking to try and get this window reassociated with the rest of this software. And it is just not playing. So um, I'm going to just do what's known as a hard <laughs> reset here okay so well, okay I, I guess i'll do some talking about globular clusters here you just um, chat for a moment on globular clusters and i'll try and start shark cap up again uh, so, while the rest of the audience now look at a diver <laughs> on the screen because uh, if i don't get that window associated with what i'm doing here it's going to drive me yes, nuts yes. so we need to manage technology not allow it to manage us. Yes, yes, right. So, so back to globular clusters, um, M22 um, has a group of so somewhere around um, 500,000 stars, a half a million stars. Now, just before Gary had to reboot his uh, software here, you were able to see uh, uh, briefly see an image of M22, and you can see it looks like sort of a fuzzy snowball. It's really, I mean, it's just a glob all in the middle. Uh, and it's sort of dense, very dense in the middle, and it fades as it goes out. Um, it's less dense on the outside portions, mostly because that globular cluster is basically like a sphere. It's like a ball. And uh, in the center of that ball, there's a higher concentration of stars, probably for a couple of reasons. First of all, there might be uh, a, a, an actual concentration due to the gravitational effect of the stars, you know, collapsing or being close together, but uh, maybe more so because when we're looking at the center of that ball of stars, we're looking through the center, which shows us a lot of stars across the center. And when we look across that, that ball of stars on the outside edge, we're looking at far less stars, just because we're looking at the edge instead of down through the through the thick part of the center. But why would this ball? of stars, this group of stars, exist in this situation? What would cause 500,000 stars to, to be grouped together in an area of space like this? And how would it be if we were on a planet and involved you know, with one of those stars as our, as our, our primary sun? Uh, what kind of light would we have from the, all of the stars around us in the middle of that ball of stars. It would be an amazing thing to just uh, think about. There are some theories. Um, one theory about, you know, for some of the globular clusters is that uh, the globular cluster is the remnants or what's left over of a small galaxy uh, which has uh, been captured or, or um, intersected with uh, the Milky Way. And as that galaxy, that small galaxy, passes through the galactic plane in the Milky Way, uh, it may have been stripped off of many of the stars on its outside edge. And uh, so the galaxy that's, uh, what's left of that small galaxy is the core itself, rather than all of the outlying edges of it. It's one theory um, that might match some of the globular clusters. And, um, you know, it's something we can think about. Knowing that a globular cluster can be, excuse me, knowing that any small galaxy could be captured by the gravitational effect of the Milky Way. And as it approaches the Milky Way, it's going to pass through the galactic plane and go into some kind of an orbit around the, 
around the Milky Way center, in which case it would pass through, extend out beyond the Milky Way, and come back around again, attracted by the center, and actually go into a, an orbit of such uh, around the center of our own galaxy. And as it passes through that galactic plane, it would certainly interact with a lot of the stars um, in that area. So that's one theory, but I'm sure there are others. Uh, hopefully we have some budding astronomers out there that in 10 or 20 years will figure all this stuff out and uh, let us know. At this point, um, we have a lot of globular clusters, well more than 100 of them uh, in our own galaxy. And this is one of the very bright ones. We'll probably look at a few galaxies, uh, excuse me, globular clusters uh, a little bit later on as well. And I think one other thing just to uh, point out while we're looking at this image is uh, you should or hopefully you can see on the YouTube feed that the stars are different colors here. Um, we have uh, some bright white stars. We have a very red star down here. And uh, I'll just point out that these colors are all indicative of the uh, temperature of the star um, and that is um, also determines what type of star it is. We have things that are cool stars that are called uh, red giants and obviously have this reddish hue. Um, some of the white to bluey white stars are much much hotter stars and you can actually see a, a pretty wide range of star colors here. Uh, just interestingly, um, the vast majority of stars in the Milky Way are actually um, much more towards the cooler side. Um, but when you actually look at most images, because cool stars are not emitting too much light and therefore are quite difficult to see, um, you don't get that impression uh, when you look at the stars either visually or through a camera as we're doing today uh, because many of those stars are just too faint to see but uh, I believe I'm correct in saying that as many as three quarters of the stars are in the red category right? I think so uh, certainly most of them um, and of course that would be in the main sequence stars would uh, evolve into that into that uh, cooler uh, realm anyway uh, let's see, a couple of questions. Um, how many stars, uh, M22? They estimate about a half a million, 500,000 stars. And uh, it's a larger cluster than many of the other ones we, we've looked at. Uh, it's about 10,000 light years away. So it's actually on our side of the galaxy. Uh, another interesting object, uh, thing to know about uh, uh, globular clusters is that they are often not found in the plane of the galaxy. They're found outside or at high inclination to the plane of the galaxy, which means that they're not orbiting the center of the galaxy the same way as our, as our own sun is or as most of the stars in the galaxy are. Uh, our galaxy is sort of a flat disk, um, and it's uh, orbiting like a big spiral. Uh, but many of these globular clusters are at high inclination to that plane and are above it and below it. And as they pass through the plane uh, in their orbit, it looks like they're not part of the original galaxy. So it's another interesting fact that uh, is uh, pretty, pretty cool. And we, we had a question from Splash Autumn um, commenting that NASA have or are using very fast internet speeds. Um, certainly quite possible, although the speed that you mentioned um, in the question seems remarkably high. Um, um, why do they use this? Well, I mean, basically, if you're trying to move any large sums of or, or, or a large amounts of data from one place to another, usually imaging. Um, to give you an idea tonight, we're streaming at about 3 megabits a second, so uh, not a very high data rate, and that's giving us um, HD quality uh, pictures on YouTube this evening. So uh, hopefully you guys are getting a, 
a good view even though we're using considerably slower internet and um, I can certainly tell you one of the disadvantages of living in Blossom Valley is don't try and make a cell phone call out here um, because the only way my T-Mobile phone now works is because I actually have my own personal base station hooked to the internet here uh, to give me T-Mobile coverage. Uh, so I, I guess I must say I appreciate them sending me that. Okay, Dave, um, let's move on to a, another target. Let's, uh, let's try a, um, a very interesting uh, Galaxy M51. Oh, okay. I looked at this only the other evening. In fact, it was one of the first images that I viewed from the house. We are swinging across the meridian. We are, yes. We're the telescope. Um, which hopefully one day I'll put a camera on, is um, basically swinging through east now, heading towards north. And we're going to cut through the north plane, which we call the meridian. And uh, we're going to swing around into the um, constellation of Canis um, Ven Venta C. Not particularly familiar with that constellation. But anyway, um, this is M51 and this is a galaxy. So this is um, this is going to be kind of like looking at something similar to our own galaxy. But this one's a little different, if I remember correctly. So I'm just going to plate solve again to make sure the telescope's pointing in the right direction. And as soon as that plate solve completes and we correct the position of the scope, we will start to image. So M51 um, has a couple of names. Um, one of them is the Whirlpool Galaxy, the name that uh, I'm used to. Um, it's also given credit to Lord Rossi, who uh, viewed the galaxy uh, through his uh, interesting telescope. And um, it's more on the northern part of the sky, and it happens to be on the west side of the meridian. So that's why we talked about the, um, it's really farther west than I thought there, Gary. Uh, that's why we had to cross the meridian, which means that our mount had to do a flip. It has to go back to a normalized position and go back to the other side, and um, it uh, shows up. Anyway, uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy uh, is it's a fascinating galaxy to view with a decent size scope at the eyepiece or to to view um, with a camera. Uh, even uh, good binoculars will give you a, a nice view of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And uh, when you see it, it will be coming up fairly soon here. Uh, it has uh, two uh, features. It has a standard, bright, beautiful, colored, uh, a spiral arm type uh, galaxy. And right next to it is another bright area that appears like they're connected. Now, I don't know the actual fact of what they are, but uh, uh, it, it sure uh, begs the question of what is the relationship between these two uh, objects? Or is the, the small object on the side, is it actually another galaxy? Are they interacting? Or is it an optical effect where one galaxy is in front of the other along our, our line of sight? So anyway, um, we can take a look at that. I'm sure there are, are some science folks out there who will have some good answers uh, on, that, on that part. But um, uh, anyway, when you see this, it would be, be kind of cool to see it. Uh, the, the Whirlpool Galaxy is about 28 million light years from here. Now, we were talking about thousands of light years when we were talking about the um, objects in our own galaxy. So the nebulas, the globular clusters, were on the order of four to 10,000 light years away. And now we're talking about 28 million light years away. So it's much farther, much, much farther. And just to put that, you know, um, to bring the point home, um, you know, you are looking back into the past here. I, looking back 28 million light 
uh, 28 million years. Uh, this light has taken that long to travel, obviously, from its source to where we are today. Um, and so what you're seeing is the galaxy and its neighbor as they were 28 million years ago. Um, things may well have changed up there over that period of time. Although, to be honest, 28 million years in the context of the life of the universe is a relatively small amount of time. Um, but you are looking back in history here. We're, we're looking back a long way at this object. Um, interestingly, I, I think the furthest object I've been able to view is about one, I think one billion light years. Um, Not sure, yeah. I think so. It's one of the quasars, I think, that um, is, is readily viewable. Um, but we are looking back um, quite some time here. Um, the image is beginning to form. I'm going to try and bring out a little more detail. Um, see if I can get the. The nice thing about this galaxy is it really does show the spiral structure that is um, apparent in many galaxies. You see this swirl here. Um, and the reason for this is, um, and I'm just being joined by my six-year-old. Are you going to come out and join us, Joy? Okay, come on. <laughs> Let's go. You can say hi to everybody online. Hi, everybody. Okay, good job. And what's your name? Mm. What's your name? Joy. Joy. And Joy is one of the youngest members of the San Diego Astronomy Association. She is a fully paid up member at the age of six. And um, she's also a big um, animal. Um, bugs. Bugs, chickens and stuff. So she's loving the new house here. We just moved seven chickens in today, which she's very excited about. And she's bought a cricket to the table that she's obviously captured um, um, as well. And you're pretty interested in astronomy, aren't you? Yeah? Okay. And, and you're very interested in the cricket. Okay, so... <laughs> I'm going to give you a kiss. No, no. And I'm I'm not sure that the people on the live stream were really expecting to hear that, but that's fine. So you off to bed. Okay, good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. We'll see you, Joy. Yeah, she's uh she's uh sometimes will actually join us on a live stream. It's kind of amusing. They say never try and do a live stream with small children and animals and there's a reason <laughs> for that <laughs> so anyway going back to where we were um the reason that we're seeing these this swirl these swirling arms is because the galaxy is rotating and it's not rotating at the same angular speed across its diameter so the middle is rotating faster than the outside and this creates these uh, very visible spiral arms and according to the information i was reading dave um these uh, galaxies are actually interacting neighbors uh the smaller one is ngc 5195 and um, for those of you who are not familiar with ngc that is the New general catalog. The, which catalog? New general catalog. The new general catalog. Um, and most deep sky objects, in fact, I think all deep sky objects, right, have an NGC Pretty number? Most of them, yeah. Um, the Messier objects are 110 objects that are essentially associated with um, the person that found them, Charles Messier. Uh, the new general catalog is a very broad um, catalog of all sorts of deep sky objects, DSOs, which is primarily what we're looking at tonight. All right, um, time for another image, Dave. Well, let's try another galaxy. How about M101? Okay, I'm just going to save that. All right, M101. 
And one of the cool things about doing electronically assisted astronomy is um, that we can actually look at a fairly large number of targets in a relatively short space of time. Um, if you were doing astrophotography, uh, yes the quality of the images would be substantially better but you would be looking at possibly just one or two images in an evening uh, whereas we're obviously able to probably go through about a new image every uh, every five minutes or so so we uh, moved on to 101 um, I'm probably on target so I'm just going to clear my live stack. so I see a couple of questions. Okay. Um, uh, can we see a rogue planet using a telescope? A rogue planet. So rogue planets are. Um, I read some things about rogue planets. Uh, the concept is that it is a planetary object which has been disassociated from uh, the uh, orbit of its uh, solar system or, or its star, and therefore it is sort of moving through interstellar space uh, as opposed to orbiting around a particular star. And, uh, you know, we've heard this term rogue planet. I believe there have actually been uh, some objects located that um, may have been described as rogue planets or objects that are uh, not in an orbit around a, a particular star. Um, so the question is, can you see it? Well. Obviously, I think anything is possible, uh, but to, the reason we can, tonight for example, we can navigate to all of these objects is that we have catalogs and we have uh, information about where these objects are uh, in space relative to Earth. And a rogue planet uh, would not have an orbit around a star, and it would be very, very difficult to uh, put an object like that into a catalog that we could actually use for finding it at some later time. Now it certainly is possible that with um, uh, astrometrics the way it is today using uh, the Gaia uh, catalogs and so forth, we might be able to come up with something that we believe is a rogue planet, but um, it'd be a very difficult thing to do. And so for, from a practical perspective, I'd say no you can't take a telescope and go find a rogue planet. Now we can see comets, but comets are in orbit around our, uh, around our sun. We can find asteroids, uh, but they're in orbit around our sun as well. So we know how to find them because we have the orbital uh, elements to, uh, to track them down. So that would be my answer, my best answer at this point on that. Also, we had a question regarding um, so is a cluster on an opposing orbit to the Milky Way. It isn't necessarily opposing in the, in the sense that it's going in the other direction. Um, the orbits of the globular clusters uh, are not necessarily associated with the, the flat galactic plane of the Milky Way. So they're not moving like our sun is around uh, the flat plane. They, uh, most, for the most part, they are moving at a high inclination to that plane, so they're above the plane, and as they go go around the the center of the galaxy, they pass through the plane, then they go below the plane, then they come back around, they come back up to above the plane, and so forth. So we find that um, this sort of a ball or a cloud of globular clusters is like uh, in all different directions from the center of the galaxy. They're not all in the same plane like all, like most of the stars are. They're uh, above it and below it, and they're moving in, the, in that kind of an orbit. So it, that's not against the rotation of the galaxy as such. It's just a, a different kind of an orbit than what we find for most of the uh, members of, the, uh, of our galaxy. Uh, hopefully that'll help with uh, some of the, uh, the questions there. So I will say, uh, just to Dave's point, um, you can certainly image um, or you, you can certainly see targets that are much smaller than potentially rogue planets. So we have a number of members in the club who actually do photometry measurements. So um, 
the intensity of light measurements off of targets such as asteroids. Um, and in fact, one of the members of the club, uh, Jeff Hilburn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jerry Hilburn. Jerry um, is, um, does this on a very regular basis. In fact, he is part of the, the number of professional and amateur astronomers looking for um, asteroids that potentially um, could cause serious problems if they uh, were to strike the Earth. Um, and um, so you can certainly see these objects and some of these objects are actually not particularly big, um, you know, kilometers across. Um, so it's certainly possible to see pretty small targets as long as you know where they are and as Dave said, all the objects we l are looking at tonight, we know precisely where they are, and therefore I'm able to bring the telescope onto them. And even if even if the telescope isn't quite pointing in the right direction with this technology called plate solving, I'm actually able to take a picture of the sky, work out where the telescope is pointing, work out what the error is, and it the the plate solver then automatically corrects the position of the telescope, which is what we're doing. And I must apologize, I'm struggling to get a good image of this, Dave. Um, we can see the shape of the galaxy, we can see the spiral arms, but I am just struggling with noise and all sorts of things on this particular image. So I think we will move on to a new target um, because for whatever reason, I'm not able to should we do something uh completely different um yeah, let's um why don't we try let's see how, how high is m27 i was going to go right to n27 okay let's go to m27 all right that okay a planetary nebula yes so and it should be about 59 degrees above the horizon right now so it's nice and high yeah and this is a completely different type of deep sky objects. So we've looked at nebulas so far, we've looked at um, globular clusters, we've looked at uh, a couple of different galaxies, and now we're going to look at what's called a planetary nebula. And as Dave said, the telescope is slewing to approximately a due east position, and this target is high in the sky. Um, so I am going to, because I moved the telescope quite some distance, I'm going to do a quick plate solve to make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. And you'll see the plate solver uh, do its, or at least capture its image. Okay, we're not too far away, 0.1 of a degree, it would have been within the field of view. Um, so we are now going to clear the previous I image. I think we'll, we should also be able to see 57. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll probably take a look at this planetary nebula and hopefully M57. Uh, it's not, it's like almost straight up, Gary. Okay. But um, the term planetary nebula, I. That really confused me when I first got into astronomy, reading about different kinds of things, and I heard of planetary nebula. And uh, the best way to explain it is that, uh, for example, M27 uh, apparently was discovered by Charles Messier, and uh, he described it as an oval nebula and uh, uh, without stars. And uh, uh, but it had dimension. It wasn't like it wasn't like a point of light because it was broad in size, and so it kind of looked like a planet. Like if you were to go out and take a look at Jupiter tonight, you would see that it's physically large and very bright. It actually, with a telescope, it actually has a uh, uh, width. Or has it's not a point of light. It's it's a ball with a with a surface on it. So it actually has dimension to it that can be measured. And when William Herschel looked at M27, he could see that it had dimension. And uh, he's, he's thinking it has dimensions like a planet. And uh, uh, Messier said that it looked like it was a nebula. And uh, so somehow, uh, 
I believe is accredited to William Herschel, uh, the name Planetary Nebula was created. So these objects are not planets, and these objects are, in fact, a nebula, but they're a very special kind of nebula. What you're seeing here is the remnants of a star, very much like our own sun, after that star runs out of primary hydrogen fuel. And what happens is the core collapses, and the outer layers of the star, uh, because they're thermally very hot, they expand into the neighboring uh, uh, space around it, into a giant cloud of nebulosity. And that core, when it collapses in the center of the star, uh, on a smaller star like our sun, it collapses into a white dwarf star, which is very uh, dense, very bright, very hot, but it, is, it does not have enough gravitational uh, energy to compress the star and begin to uh, fuse heavy elements. So it remains as a white dwarf star, which creates a lot of light, and that light is reflected off the gases around it as they expand into the neighboring area. Those gases, if you look at this, this image, I think we can see it here. Um, they, in our image, we have colors, uh, we have areas, we have geometric shapes, and what that is, it's, it's indication of the direction uh, that the, uh, the material expanded or the direction that it's being illuminated or, or some other kinds of forces on that, that cloud of nebulosity that cause it to move in these geometric shapes and to have colors. So it, it's, they're, they're beautiful objects. Um, this one is fairly large and uh, it's only about 1400 light years from us, so it's not too far away. So and, uh, that's, sorry to interrupt, yes, go ahead. that's the size relative to the moon. So the moon would basically fill the entire field of view. Right. So that gives you uh, the indication of how big it is relative to the size of the moon. And it's then about the size of uh, Mare Imbrium on the moon. There's something like one of the largest right. seas. Yeah. Right, so there's a much. Yeah. So uh, for those that don't understand how stars work, uh, and, and, and Cindy, my wife, I'm sure you're listening, uh, say, please don't tell me uh, to start with the beginning of creation and move towards you know, all the mathematics here. I'll try to get to the point. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, a, a star is a basically a, f a, a fusion reactor where gravity takes mostly hydrogen gas compresses it and uh, creates a higher energy level. And because of the gravitational energy, it actually ignites that um, uh, hydrogen fuel into a fusion, fusion process. And that fusion process releases light and, light and heat and pushes that out. And uh, it creates uh, uh, helium, mostly helium. So the helium is now a heavier element than hydrogen and it stays in the center of the star. So it consumes hydrogen and creates helium. If the star is bigger, the helium gets compressed and uh, it's fused into heavy elements like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and so forth. And all these layers are like uh, layers of an onion and the heaviest elements are in the center. But in a small star like our sun, it may not have enough gravitational energy to begin secondary layers or third layers of uh, fusion. So what happens is uh, the core, when it collapses into a white dwarf, is fairly small. Uh, it has a lot of heat, but it doesn't have an, a lot of gravitational energy to support any further fusion reaction. And that's what we have here. That white dwarf collapses down to the center, and all of the gases around it, the outer layers of the sun, uh, expand into the neighboring environment. And then the white dwarf illuminates all those gases from inside, making this uh, beautiful object that we're looking at that we now call a planetary nebula. Now, if our sun is maybe eight or 10 times larger than it is, then instead of creating a planetary nebula when it collapses, it could collapse um, or interact with another star and uh, actually explode as a supernova, which would be a different way 
that a star would uh, come to the end of its life. But many of the common stars, like our own, end up like this planetary nebula uh, here, M27. And uh, they're very beautiful objects, and uh, it's a lot of fun to take a look at them because they all have different shapes, and they all have different colors. So a uh, couple of interesting facts. The, um, the star in the center, which is creating this planetary nebula, is a white dwarf star. It's about 60% of the uh, sun's mass, but actually only 5% of the sun's diameter. And it has an extremely hot surface temperature of 85,000 Kelvin. And the, the main green color here you're seeing on the screen is because it's emitting so much uh, ultraviolet, which is uh, causing the, uh, the oxygen to ionize. It's emitting green light at basically 501 nanometers. And that's this vivid green color that you can see over the majority of the spherical shape of the planetary nebula. This is probably one of the easiest uh, targets to um, image, either with EAA or, or um, if you're doing astrophotography. It's a very bright uh, target um, and uh, extremely pretty, uh, called the Dumbbell Nebula uh, because of the sort of central dumbbelly shape with the red uh, edges to it. Um, okay. Are we going to try another planetary before we move on? Sure. Um, on the way over to M57, we might stop at Alberio. Okay. Would that, would that uh, show you the colors with your setup, do you think? You mean the star? Yeah. Um, I'm going to need a... The binary star. Okay. I'm going to need a number or something. Uh, if you go from... Uh, reduce your size. Sorry? Oh. On your... Sorry, we're talking about the sky map, so Dave is trying to orientate me. I think if we, um, oh, you have a dense field in your Yeah, map. I do, yeah. sorry. It's, it's right in the middle of the uh, summer triangle. Okay, um, what's it called? Alberio, oh. A-L-B-I. B-I? B-I, yeah. A-L-B-I-O? Uh, I-R-E-O. I R E O. Okay, let's see if I can. We're using a, a program called Carte de Seal to navigate the sky, and uh, there are many different programs out there. Uh, on my uh, tablet, I'm using Sky Safari or uh, something else. But uh, okay, I'm there. Um, I've just got to reset everything here. So. Um, I only mentioned Alberio because it is on the way to uh, M57. Okay. Let's see if I'm a found a target. That doesn't look very promising, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's put the plate solver to work. And see if we can find you may out. You have to increase your magnification quite a bit to see it. That might be it right there. Is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Could be. So, so uh, what what magnitude are we looking at here? Um, three to five. Okay. So, oh, there it is. One, one, I think one is uh, magnitude three, one's magnitude five, something like that. Okay. Um, they're blue and and gold colored sort of. All right. Uh, so many of the stars that in our in the visible universe actually have binary companions, and um, there are two stars that in orbit around each other. Usually, one of them is a larger star, um, and uh, sort of anchors the pair. And um, here we go. So. Uh, a binary star is two stars that are actually gravitationally connected. But there's another kind of, of double star that we can look at. And what we're looking at here with Alberio is not a binary companion. It's most probably what we call sort of a visual line of sight. It turns out that the stars are lined up almost, to, almost exactly with our line of sight. So it looks like they're connected to each other. 
but the probability that they are connected gravitationally is very, very small. Whereas many of the other stars that we see in the sky that we call binaries, um, we can actually measure the rotation of the stars. But anyway, uh, this is a nice uh, pair of stars. The uh, uh, interesting thing about Albireo is that it is the foot of the cross, the Northern Cross. And uh, if you look at uh, the constellation of Cygnus in the sky, um, which is the swan, then Albireo is the head or the eye of the swan. So uh, it is literally in the center of the summer triangle. And uh, these are all a bunch of words I know. Uh, for those of you that have been familiar with some of these objects, you'll understand a little bit about the summer triangle and the constellation of Cygnus. And uh, Albireo is at the, uh, the end. It's facing towards the, basically towards the south. And uh, anyway, that's, that's very interesting. It's also very beautiful in, a, in an eyepiece. Uh, they have nice, brilliant colors. And uh, it's kind of fun to do. That's about it for that. We can probably move on to uh, M57. But again, I, I, it's probably worth pointing out here, we are actually seeing quite a marked color difference between the two components here. Uh, we obviously have the larger, cooler star and a much smaller, brighter companion. So this star is much has got a much hotter surface temperature. Um, and and really, David, I, would you pick that up visually? That oh yes, you, you would absolutely right. So yeah, if you have uh, even a small telescope with decent objects and a fairly dark sky, you get a nice, brilliant color differential. Right. And uh, if you're in a larger scope um, and uh, uh, take a look at it, the color is is striking. It's right. very blue and gold. In fact, we used to call it before the history. Of San Diego Sports changed it. We used to call it the Charger Star. Ah, okay. That was the old Charger colors. Dave, <laughs> Dave is showing his age now, folks. Because I am. I'm fairly. I'm no spring chicken, and I don't remember <laughs> that. So, but then I'm English, so I probably wouldn't be expected to remember that. So, uh, where How are we going now, M57. Dave? M57. M57. Yeah, that should be pretty much straight up. All right, so uh, we're now. Hopefully, you'll be able to get to that. Um, oh, I can get though. And um, I think. All right. I'm not sure how close it is to the ecliptic. All uh, right, so I just need to make a few adjustments here. And what am I looking at, though? A uh, another planetary nebula, oh. the ring. Okay. Okay. The ring nebula. All right. Yeah. Let me plate solve then and just make sure I'm in the right place. Oh, okay. Right. I remember this one. This is another uh, planetary nebula. Uh, hopefully we can get it on screen and um, we'll show you how much different it looks than the, uh, the dumbbell nebula that we looked at a few moments ago. Yes, and we, we are repositioning the scope more than the uh, field of view, so um, we need to wait for the next image to come yeah. up. I need to clear my live stack. And once again, I've managed to get this window disassociated with the rest <laughs> of the screen. Mm. That's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what went wrong there, Dave? Uh, hold on. I'm looking at your scope. Well, your scope's pointing in the right direction. <laughs> yes, but I see no... It, uh, M57 is smaller than M27, but it's very bright. And um, we uh, hopefully will be able to uh, pick it up here in a minute. Uh... Okay. Um, I hate this window, Scott. This is so mm, that's kind of a new feature. <laughs> All right, let me let me plate solve again and see if I can work out what's going on. Um, All right, just give us a second, okay. folks. Um, looks like we're having our so M57. Hopefully, we can get it here shortly. 
uh, it's about 1,400 light years away, and uh, it's another planetary nebula, um, and uh, it's more of a donut. In fact, it looks very much like a donut with a big hole in the middle. And uh, hopefully. Oh, you know what the problem is? No, I do not. I think I've hit a. I think the telescope has. Oh, at the stop. It's hit oh, on one okay. of its stops. So we might, it's pretty close to the meridian, I think. Because the plate solver's trying to move it, and it's just refusing to move. Uh, so I okay. think I think I'm okay. I'm not going to get to it. All well, right. Um, we can leave that one yep. and for another night. Uh, Want to try a couple of globulars on the east before we move on? Sure. Uh, how about M15 is a nice globular cluster. All right. Okay. Let's see what its position is right now. We yeah. are... So we've done... Um, what, what type of deep sky object have we not seen so far? Can we pick a... Um, we've seen standard... We haven't really done an open cluster, have we? Have no, we haven't. Uh, we might be able to do M11. Okay. Um, let's see if we can get M15 here All right. first. It's another really, really pretty. Right. Uh, and it is currently 43 degrees up at 104. So it should be right up middle eastern sky. Yeah. Above the Jupiter there. And that should work out pretty nice. All right. Uh, so so Messier Object 15 is another globular cluster. Um, this one is about 34,000 light years away, which is more typical of the globular clusters because they're actually close to or in orbit around the center of the galaxy. So, um, you know, this is a nice one. It actually has a, a seen colors and the stars in this, and uh, um, it's a it's very cool. Okay, and we we've, we've got the target. Um, the telescope was still moving on the first right I got it now oh there you go so yeah. let's just bring this down okay Not too many. okay I'll zoom in a so uh, m15 is another another wonderful wonderful cluster um, a moment ago, we talked about the orbit of globular, globular clusters around the center of the galaxy, and this is another classic example at uh, 34,000 light years away, puts it towards, actually towards the center of the galaxy, and um, uh, it's uh, uh, fairly large, fairly bright. Um, let's see who is discovered. I don't see. Well, I mean, it's it's going to be Messier again, right? Um, could be... Actually, no, discovered uh, earlier than that. Uh, Messier included it in his catalog, uh, discovered by someone the last name of uh, Maraldi in 1746. So um, these brighter clusters should have been discovered earlier because they're not difficult to find. And um, they are... Uh, you know, something that you would probably take note of if you're searching the sky. So this one is, um, uh, science notes say that it has a luminosity of about 360,000 stars or suns. So it's a little bit smaller than M22 that we looked at earlier, but um, it's still very, very large because many of the smaller globular clusters only have, you know, 50 to 100,000 stars. I say only. It still blows my mind that we have 360,000 stars that are held together gravitationally in this one little spot in space. And um, I, I'm not satisfied with the explanations that I've read in my in my uh, studies. So um, maybe somebody out there can come up with something new. But uh, anyway, that's cool. Yeah, and they. They're beautiful objects, and I, and I will say that um, you know I I do very little visual observing, but if you really want to see how spectacular a 
a globular cluster is you you want to look at it in a large visual scope because the pinpoints of light really stand out whereas when we do what we're doing here with electronically assisted astronomy the um the the stars tend to bloat somewhat and you kind of lose the the visual impression of the thousands of stars that you can see through like your dob, right? Um, through a large aperture telescope, yeah. visually, uh, a globular cluster will look like, it actually looks like sugar dropped on black velvet. So each of those little stars is like a grain of sugar and it's all stacked up. Yes. Uh, it, it's absolutely gorgeous when you see it visually. And uh, it's possible to get uh, images that look like that, but it takes a little bit longer than the, uh, the two or three minutes yes. we're spending on one of these images here. Yeah. So um, we're sort of, uh, the military calls it uh, for familiarization. We're showing you these things so that you can become familiar with them and then go uh, examine them yourselves for whatever you like to do. But uh, uh, yeah, M15 is another one of the beautiful globular clusters and uh, they just amaze me. I, I cannot understand them. They're, why yes. are they there? Where do they come from? Uh, they're just uh, so different, so unusual. Yeah, I remember when we were at uh, Marino Lake and uh, we looked, I think you had your 16-inch dob out and oh, we yeah. did a couple of the globs. Yeah. And uh, just so pretty. Um, you don't quite get it um, on the screen here um, but for instance um, the nebulars that we're seeing really show far better with a camera than you would visually um, but uh, globs really do show well visually in a large they do. scope yeah, they, they do very well visually yeah and that supports uh, our concept of which we, what we'd like to do in the future where we combine visual observing with uh, EAA kinds of demonstrations of objects at the same event. Uh, we hope to be able to take this process we're doing here out to the field on the ground where people are meeting with us in person. And we'll have optical scopes on one part of the ground and we'll have uh, EAA based electronic observing uh, on the other side. And it's fascinating. We've been doing this for many, many years uh, with a few uh, of our members who have supported uh, that kind of uh, technology and done extremely well. And uh, we hope that all of you who are listening that are doing that may come back and join us again when we get get back out there. But anyway, uh, so Gary. Um, I'm going to try Jupiter. Oh, okay. Cindy yes. was asking uh -oh. if we could do a planet. And since we <laughs> we might as well we're, try something we're different. We're close to Jupiter right now, so um, it shouldn't be hard to get over there. Well, I'm over there already. Oh, okay. Um, now I just got to find out whether I actually am in the right place. So I'm again, I'm going to use the stars to position accurately on the planet. And we'll see what we can get. Now, I will say planets do not really suit this type of scope. So, um, but bear with us. I'll, oh, well, I found an image. So that's good. Okay. So let's, probably need to reduce yeah, the so I've got, got to do all sorts yeah. of things here. Uh, okay. All right. So. All right. Okay. A couple of the, uh, I see a couple of the uh, moons there. Oh, look. You there you go. Imaging. There we go. All right. So let's bring up the exposure a little bit. Okay. So as Dave was saying, we've got probably two of the moons here. Sure. Okay. And I probably should change my tracking here right and those two moons uh, are probably Europa and Io okay all right yes so those are the two moons uh, let's pull back oh, we got another moon here um, yes let's see that would be Ganymede okay 
All right. So we've got a couple of moons. Io, you're up again, Ymede, and... Where's Callisto? Now, now we... Be because there. the brightness of this target is so bright compared to the stars that we were looking at, we're now using extremely short exposures, so about 20 milliseconds, and we can see... Uh, Jupiter itself, which is completely overexposed, and we can see three of the moons. So we'll just go in a little bit. Okay, so now you can see the three moons. And now, if I zoom right in on the planet and bring the exposure down... Now, hopefully, we can... S there we go. All right. Okay, so this isn't going to be great um, because planets don't show particularly well. Um, but you can see Jupiter. You can see the two bands, the two major bands. Um, and if we were to take a video of this and then do some processing, we could actually get quite a good image. Um, but since that is going to totally tempt fate, <laughs> I'm not even going to try it um, this evening because I haven't done that in a long while and I'm not sure I can remember the steps to go through. Um, but you do actually see Jupiter here. Uh, you can see the two bands. I'm not sure that we're going to get much of a better picture. It's, but at least... Um, now, again, the planets generally show very well in a, in a visual scope. Um, so you'd see a lot more detail. Um, I can... I can show you that detail or get to that detail with a lot of image processing, but um, not just taking single pictures. All right, so um, it's actually, it's, it's, we've, we've had probably 90 degree temperatures today um, out in Blossom Valley. It's been fairly, fairly warm, but um, it's actually quite chilly uh, this evening. Um, I was, if I can find the right piece of software, of which I have many, um, and for some reason I don't seem to be able to, uh, but one of the things I've, I've got on the telescope is um, a temperature and humidity sensor, um, so that that controls dew controllers, um, which basically heaters. Uh, to keep the dew off the telescope. Um, and I was going to tell you the temperature, but um, I seem to have lost that particular icon. So anyway, let's go for one. Uh, I'm thinking since we're close by, yeah. uh, we might we might try this uh, galaxy and Pegasus. Okay. Uh, magnitude 9. It's uh, 9 uh, arc minutes okay. across. Uh, NGC 7. Three, three, one. Well, I've done this one before in the past. What, what's it called? Um, I'm not sure if it has a common name. Um, it has a common name, NGC 7331. Really? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I have seen this as well. It's uh, part of a, a cluster of galaxies in the area. It's the largest one in that cluster. And uh, uh, it is uh, it is pretty striking. Um, I don't know how it's going to appear tonight. Okay. Um, it's about 40 degrees up in the sky, so it's high enough. And um, let's see, we're at um, 070, so it'd be just a little bit on the north side. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we got a question here. How close are the orbits of the moons? The moons look far away from the planet. So we're obviously Ooh. going back to Jupiter. I would have to research the actual distance of the Galilean moons. Io is the closest one. Um, 
and um, they're at different different uh, positions. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what that distance is without just doing a quick search on it. It's not right under my, my fingertips here. Uh, but an interesting thing about those four moons, uh, when Galileo first turned his telescope to the sky and looked at Jupiter, he found those four moons. And he watched those four moons um, over many days and many weeks and realized that they were moving and they're moving back and forth across the planet in a very odd kinds of ways. And uh, in his careful analysis of that, he said the only way that he could uh, reconcile that motion was that those objects were in orbit around Jupiter. So he m made that conclusion that those objects were in orbit around Jupiter. But of course, that was contrary to the convention of the day where everything was supposed to be orbiting around the Earth. And uh, so it caused great problems for him when he was sort of supporting the Copernican view of, uh, of, the, of the solar system. But his uh, sketches and notations regarding the positions of those moons over the periods of days and weeks uh, can be found quite easily probably through Wikipedia. And um, his sketches are fan fascinating. They're not very detailed, but they show a lot of motion about, these, about those objects. And uh, those uh, four moons of Jupiter have since been named the Galilean moons uh, in his honor because um, uh, he actually recorded their uh, orbital motion in about 1610, I think. It's amazing. So is this our galaxy? It is. And I'm is no it fuzzy up there? You know, I was... It seem that way. No, I was looking at this image and thinking how remarkably bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> we may have some uh, moisture or dust or something up on up high. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but that's horrible. So uh, we're, we do have an image of a galaxy, which um, it's not a particularly uh, satisfying image. And I'm not sure why. Neither am I. But um, it's another uh, interesting galaxy discovered by William Herschel. Imagine William Herschel discovering a galaxy. Um, and um, see if I can tell you much about it. It's about 47 million light years away, so it's quite a ways off. Um, fairly large in size, and it's a largest member of a group of galaxies that will all show in the same image. And um, it's kind of cool to be able to see it. I have seen images of this that make it look like a spiral that's sort of tipped over partly on its edge. And it looks like the center is kind of warped for some reason, like it's sunk. And uh, we can't see any of that in the image tonight. I don't know what's going on here, but, uh, uh, you know, it is a, a cool... I'm analogy. wondering, actually, I'm wondering if we've got two issues, Dave. Well, it could be. Okay, so, you know, this... I believe is the problem here. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we're beginning to do up. Um, just for those who um, are interested here, I actually found the controller software. Um, so we are at what appears to be a very chilly 17 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. But 94% oh, relative wow. humidity, and I'm not sure if yeah. my dew heaters are actually running here, um, which is interesting. Okay, so it's telling me relative humidity is high. <laughs> Please make sure you have your heaters on. Okay, and I'm drawing current. So um, the heaters are on. Hmm. Um, so for those of you that are, are not uh, imagers, uh, we're using a schmidt caspian telescope that Gary uh, introduced you to at the beginning of this session. And a schmidt caspian telescope has a great big piece of glass in the front of it um, called a corrector, corrector plate. And that great big piece of glass um, tends to get dewed up very easily. And uh, it is sort of the bane of using a uh, Schmidt cast grain for observing in wet conditions. 
So anyway, Gary's doing a quick check. You know, it's pretty clear. And he says that that might not be the problem. No. Maybe it's just the uh, dew that in the atmosphere. Uh, and my dew heaters are on. I can feel the heat. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we're just not going to get a good image of this well, target. We're sort of running out of some targets here. Um, Shall we try one to finish off? Let's tr uh, try and make it a good so one. So I, I think M31 is too low. It's only about 17 degrees off the horizon. Okay. And it might not be good. Um, how about one of the uh, nebulas, either the Pac-Man or the Iris? Okay. Um, they are... Uh, the iris is much higher. It's a set, it's at 47 degrees high, so okay. that'd be a good way to go. And that is NGC 7023. All right. So let's swing the scope. It's, uh, it's sort of in the mostly in the north, just east of the uh, meridian in the north. Okay. All right, so the telescope has slewed. And I must, okay, that looks promising. Um, and I must admit, I'm a bit rusty at the moment because uh, I've literally been involved in this, selling my previous house and buying this one now for about two to three months and uh, done no astronomy. Um, so, it's uh it's kind of difficult to get used to everything again uh, but we will try and finish off with at least ngc 7023 the iris Nebula. yeah um, i'm just concerned i'm getting so much noise on these mm. images at the moment mm. i do not understand why that is happening what's the pac-man look like because i know the iris is fairly difficult to uh, image pac-man is at 23 degrees off the horizon uh right now and uh that is um ngc 281 all right I'm just wondering what's gone wrong here. Um. Do, 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 do. Something is not quite right here at the moment. I just get the feeling that we're picking up a lot of noise. Um. Okay. Um. Nope. Let's move on from the iris, Dave. That this one's not going to image well either. Well, let's let's try NGC two eight one, the Pac Man. Okay. It's uh, same part of the sky, and uh, other than that, I can give you things to look at. And by the way, uh, that ninety three percent humidity, whatever. Yes. My my paper notes, they're so wet I can't write on them with yeah. pencil. <laughs> so we are getting wet out here. Yeah, is is it is getting wet. Um, it was interesting. I got a load of stuff outside uh, with the move, and uh, most of it was soaked this morning <laughs> when when I woke up. So um, it does does get a little bit humid here at times. Okay, so let's see if we can finish off with. It's an about ten thirty-two. All so right, we're getting down here. Okay, let's see if we can finish off with at least one decent image okay that looks more promising although well I can show you here w when when you start seeing um, a histogram shape that looks like this Typically, it's noisy, and uh, I'm not sure what's causing this noise at the moment. But anyway, um, let's give it a little bit of time here, and uh, hopefully, we can we can finish off with the Pac-Man. 
not right. not quite centered but um close enough and we've had quite a nice range of images this evening um my plan for this location is probably a permanent observatory uh which will be nice um albeit that i think for the rest of this year i'll be using the more portable setup um and i might be getting a jacket next time it's getting chilly out here <laughs> Just surprised how cold it's got. My chickens um, were literally panting this afternoon. It was so warm, uh, but uh, they're going to be huddled together this evening. All right. So one of the interesting things about the Pac-Man Nebula, other than the fact that uh, it's named after the first game I ever began playing. Uh, on a computer, and I'm not sure if uh, Gary. Yeah, well, I played Pac-Man. Pac okay, good. Um, but it was uh, not discovered by William Herschel. <laughs> uh, it was actually discovered by E. E. Barnard in 1883. So it's a fairly recent discovery. And um, in 1883, the uh, NGC catalog was in probably its second printing already. So um, it was uh, long after the Herschels were observing. But um, anyway, it, this is a, uh, a hydrogen region, um, uh, H, called an H2 region. It's near Cassiopeia, in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And um, I'm not sure what the rate of star formation is, but uh, it is, uh, it's pretty cool. If you do want to look at something like this in a large aperture telescope with an eyepiece, um, if you're looking at uh, these emission nebulas like this, you want to use something like a narrowband filter that we call an O3 filter. And an O3 filter helps bring out the nebulosity uh, to where you can actually see it quite nicely. And um, so uh, this nebula is about 4,000 light years from here. Um, it's uh, Yeah, and conditions have certainly changed. Boy, this is interesting. Uh, in this con conflicting information about the distance, uh, one uh, catalog says 4,000 light years, another says 10,000 light years. So let's say it's somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 light years, and it kind of gives us uh, where it is. That's on this side of the center of our galaxy. Yeah, and I'm... I'm I'm thinking, Dave, it's the humidity that's causing th this issue. Um, yeah. Really, I'm struggling uh, here. Um, we, even though we're about 25 miles inland um, at this location, um, we still do get marine layer effects. So it's, um, it is uh, possible that... Um, that's beginning to spoil the images the this evening, and um, I am going to switch this monitoring off because uh, that's driving me crazy. Um, so I think we'll probably finish off um, at this point with the Pac-Man. Again, not the best of images because I think we are now beginning to struggle with um, conditions a little bit. I think the marine layer is beginning to push in even though we can still see stars um, but we're definitely beginning to lose detail um, so i think this is a good point to transition across to our closing slide uh, which just provides um, information on who you've been listening to this evening so the Myself, Gary Hawkins, and uh, Dave Decker from the San Diego Astronomy Association doing a live outreach event. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, um, and we also have a, a webpage at sdaa.org. Um, as Dave mentioned at the very beginning of the broadcast, uh, we're a pretty active group. We do a lot of outreach events a year. Um, 
well, certainly before the pandemic, um, but we're beginning to uh, start our outreach program um, again um, this year uh, in person. So uh, please take a look at the calendar for events coming up. And uh, myself and Dave will probably, uh, well, almost certainly will be doing more live events uh, through the course of the year uh, to complement what's taking place on a face-to-face -face value. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the presentation this evening. Um, Dave, uh, why don't you finish off with a few words and uh, we'll then let the folks here get to bed. And um, I think um, we'll find somewhere a little warmer and less wet. Uh, so we thank you, a small group of participants tonight. Um, and uh, you all were very persistent. Uh, thanks a million. I hope you learned a few things. Uh, I am Dave Decker, the Outreach Coordinator for the Astronomy Association. And you can reach me at outreach at sdaa.org. That email address is on our website. Uh, I'm happy to respond to any questions about the program we had tonight or what we're doing in the future. Any comments or questions about the outreach program in general, uh, feel free to send me email and uh, be happy to, uh, to respond and, uh, and uh, let you know what's happening out here. Uh, thanks again for participating tonight. I think uh, it's a good time for us, Gary, to, uh, to shut things down here and uh, uh, get this all cleaned up. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody who's been online and listening to this, and uh, we've enjoyed doing this outreach event this evening. So um, we look forward to seeing you again at some point in the future. Just keep an eye on either Facebook or the website for uh, announcements of both face-to-face uh, -face and online events. So it's a uh, good evening from me and good evening from him. Good evening. <laughs>